Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, today we have a few things that we're going to do in our next video. Um, we're going towards this big question in the unit of the P versus NP problem, and today we're actually going to learn what P and NP are. So first, we're going to finish off a little bit about decision problems, and uh, that's, we, we talked a bit about that last class, so we'll just kind of make sure we're all on the same page there. Then that's pretty much all we need to discuss the complexity um, class that's called P which is the class of all problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Then we're going to move on from that and talk about the two really important concepts for NP, which is first of all certificates and second of all verifiers. So what is a certificate and what is a um, verifier? And specifically, we're wanting short certificates and fast verifiers. And if you have those two things, then your problem is in the other complexity class that's called um, NP. And so that's the, the things that we're going to introduce today. So we'll kind of formally say, what is this class P? Then we'll define these two topics called certificates and verifiers that gives us the class NP. Roughly speaking, P is the class of problems where you can quickly find the answer. And the class NP is the class of problems where you can quickly check the answer, but you can't necessarily compute it quickly. Okay, so first about decision problems. Um, we introduced this last time and talked about it a little bit in class. And so the idea is the challenge is to have your decision problem have the same difficulty as the original problem. We can always turn something into a yes or no question or just come up with a yes or no question, but the challenge is to make it like capture the original difficulty. So um, for example, in, in class today, we talked a little about like integer factorization. What would be the decision problem version of that is a lot of times we wanna add another parameter. So in this case, we would add another parameter like D and ask the question like, does X have a factor less than or equal to D? Right, so that's, that's not asking what are the factors of x, but it's saying does it have a factor that's less than this bound. Um, for a minimum vertex cover, again, we're going to say um, does the graph G have a vertex cover with size less than or equal to k. And again, so it's not saying tell me what the vertex cover is, but it's asking like it, does there exist one that's at least this good. Um, for like the scheduling problem that we looked at a little bit is um, can uh, can we have at least k non overlapping appointments right so it's not necessarily asking for what that is but it's also not saying like does a solution exist or can you schedule this appointment because any individual appointment that's too easy of course we can schedule just that one the question is, can we schedule? How many can we schedule? What you should notice is that um, there's a difference between like vertex cover, which is a minimization problem, or EI scheduling, which is a maximization, when it's scheduled the maximum number of appointments. Um, and so that kind of lends itself to having a greater than or equal to or less than or equal to here. Uh, so a lot of times for these um, decision problems, versions of some kind of an optimization thing, we ask kind of, is there a solution that's at least this good? And at least this good might mean that it's big, like in the case of appointment scheduling, or it might mean that it's small in the case of a minimum vertex cover problem. Uh, so again, this is with factorization, um, and we can think about it both ways. So if we have a number n that we're trying to factor, that, as I called this x before, but n is what we're trying to factor. So the question is like, uh, just to be clear, the, qu the problem we're solving here is like, does n have a factor less than or equal to k? Um, so if we have this, an instance of the decision problem, how could we use the computational least prime factor version to solve it is I, it really obvious, but a lot of times there's gonna be like really obvious things in this unit that we have to nonetheless like say and kind of spell it out. Um, so in this case, how would we solve the decision problem, if we could do the computational problem, is I could just compute the full factorization and then return true if and only if the smallest prime factor is less than or equal to k. So um, it's 
maybe it's kind of obvious, but this is just saying that if we could solve the computational version, then we could definitely solve the decision version. But it also goes the other way. So if we could solve the decision version, how could we use that to solve the computational version? Well, the computational version just starts with n. So I would just do like some kind of a binary search um, to find binary search to find k such that um, n does have a factor less than or equal to k, but does not have a factor less than or equal to k minus 1. Right, so we can, we can check whether k has this property by running the decision problem twice, and then it's a binary search to find where this number is. And um, so we only have to do log n instances of the, of the, um, of the decision problem version, and that is going to tell us that, so what we have to finally say, what's the answer to the computational problem? The answer is going to be uh, k itself, right? So n has a factor that's less than or equal to k, but not less than or equal to k minus 1. So k must be the smallest factor. Then k is the smallest factor. And it must be a prime number by definition, because uh, if there was a small, if k were not prime, then n would have an even smaller factor of whatever factor of k it is. So this is just saying, how do we show that this decision problem is formally like equivalent in terms of difficulty to the original problem? It's saying that I can solve one problem with the other one directly, and I can go the other way with only log n number of runs. So with a polynomial time number of runs, I can kind of go back in, be in forth between these. So in terms of polynomial running time, these are both the same. In other words, if we have a polynomial time algorithm for the decision problem, then that means we also have a polynomial time algorithm for the computational version of actually finding the factor, and vice versa. If we don't have a, a polynomial time version of the decision problem, then there also does not exist any polynomial time version of the original one. And so that's nice because, again, in terms of some of our formal tools for comparing things, we can only um, deal with decision problems given the definitions that we're going to use. So here's a few uh, formal definitions. I'll just kind of go through these quickly, but it'll be useful for us to have these problems. We're kind of accumulating problems as we go um, in order for us to be able to talk about things. Some of these are hard problems, some of these are not, um, but we can come up with decision versions of all of them. So finding the shortest path from u to v, how can we frame that is like finding, given a graph and an integer, does it have a path that's a length at most k? So why is it at most here is because, again, this is like a shortness, a, a minimization type thing. And so we're looking for something at most k. Um, the longest path problem is really the same exact thing, except that now we're changing instead of looking for a path at, of length at most k, we're looking for at least k. And for all these, we want to think about what is the input size. Um, remember that so we have a few different ways of representing a graph. Um, but they don't really matter that much between them, remember, because we're just focusing on polynomial time or not. So we can just assume um, like the adjacency list representation, so the, or sorry, the adjacency matrix representation. So the input size, we can just say adjacency matrix and it's n squared, where n is the number of vertices. Of course, you know that the adjacency list representation might be a little bit smaller, but why do we not bother with that? It's just because n squared versus uh, n plus m, we know the number of edges is never more than n squared. And so since that is already a polynomial time relationship, we can just go with the simple one, which is just say, hey, it's definitely less than n squared for the input size, and that's going to be easy enough. And of course, the um, representation is the same for the longest path problem as well. It's just a matter of whether we're looking for something at most k or least k. And one thing you can think about, just as a hint, we know fast algorithms to do shortest path, like Dijkstra's. For a longest path, we don't know any algorithms. If you think about a graph and you're trying to kind of find the most roundabout way to get from one vertex to another, um, that's a much harder thing, it turns out, to do than finding the most direct path. Uh, OK, so also factorization. So we just talked about this. Um, in this case, the input size is the length of n. So the input size is like log base 2 of n. And k has to be less than that. So um, 
So that's where that one comes from. And notice that's why that kind of controls, we, we talked about this many times, like the value versus the size. So if n is the value of the integer we're trying to factor, the size of it is log base two of n because that's the number of bits, number of bits to represent n. Remember that when we're talking about comparing problems, we always want to compare them on, on fair terms, which means just thinking about the input size and bits. And for vertex cover, again, um, we can say that the input size here is n squared, just using like an adjacency matrix representation, keep it simple. And the, the question is, does it have a vertex cover with the most k nodes? We know that k has to be less than or equal to n, because otherwise the, the question is trivially true. So um, that's all we have to think about really for the input size is just like n squared. Um, and again, like we said, we're looking for, does there exist a vertex cover that has size at most k? So like, like a lot of these things, you end up adding an extra parameter of saying like, how good is the answer to the decision problem version? Okay, so now that we've kind of beat the decision problems thing to, <laughs> to death, we can talk about the formal definition of our first complexity class, which is P. It's all decision problems that can be solved by an algorithm um, in polynomial time in terms of the input size. And that's all we have to say. Um, we know a lot of things that are members of this class. So all of the um, things where we know fast algorithms like short path and, um, and what did we just talk about? Not factorization. So I think short path is the only one out of those ones that we just saw, but like um, min uh, does this array contain a number that's at most k, um, finding the max in an array, um, multiplication, addition, all, most, most of the problems that we've talked about in class so far, until the last few that we covered in the graph uh, unit, were all polynomial time, right? We could solve them all with fast algorithms um, that run in big O of n to the something. The only, um, and, and sorting I would also put in here, although we have to think a little bit about what it means to have a decision problem of sorting, but the point is that however you would define that is definitely going to be polynomial time. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that this is big O. So one thing to remember is that uh, big O just means an upper bound. Um, so I'll just put this down. Like when we think about sorting, we have algorithms that are n log n time. And why does that fit in with big O of n to the k? Well, remember, uh, that log of n is definitely big O of n, right? It's not big theta of n. Log of n is smaller, but it's big O of n. So that means that, for example, um, n log n is big O of n squared. So this is just an upper bound. In terms of practical sorting algorithms, we really care about the difference between n log n and n squared. But when we're just thinking about is it a member of P or not, you know, selection sort um, is polynomial time just as much as merge sort is polynomial time. Okay, so that's the class P. Uh, it has some nice properties when we want to deal with it, which is that almost any way of combining polynomial time algorithms gives us another polynomial time algorithm. It's very nice. So that in terms of like math properties, we talk about the class of polynomial time algorithms being closed under doing uh, one after the other. So if we run a polynomial time algorithm many times, um, that's fine. We can run a polynomial time algorithm with inside another uh, loop, that's also fine because if you have an n to the k loop and an n to the l loop inside that, it's just n to the k plus l, which is another polynomial. It's a bigger polynomial, but again, we only care about whether it's polynomial or not. And even composition, so if we replace every time we would have added two numbers with some other polynomial time algorithm, that's actually totally fine. So we can do a lot of combining. This is really just saying that if you're building up a larger algorithm by combining some polynomial time algorithms um, in these kind of ways, so combining polynomial time kind of subroutines, then most of the ways you can do that are going to end up being still polynomial time. You should notice that what's missing here, um, which is not always going to give you polynomial time, is recursion. 
So it's always good to think about, you know, what's not on the list, what can't you do that is necessarily going to preserve polynomial time, and that's recursion. The, the, in fact, all of the algorithms we've seen so far that are not in a polynomial running time all involve using recursion or going through some exponential time loop. So I think it's, it's kind of obvious if you go through a loop that's two to the n times, okay, that's not a polynomial running time. But it's also um, exponential running time can happen easily with recursion. Like I think we saw some problems that have a complexity like t of n equals one plus two times t of n minus one. So you make like two recursive calls um, after reducing the size only by one. And this ends up being big theta of two to the n running time, not in polynomial, not polynomial. Um, so that's just to say recursion is kind of what you, super long loops and recursion are the things to look out for. But most of the other things that you would do algorithmically are just going to keep it in polynomial time. And now we're ready to introduce the other thing. So the second half of today, we're going to talk about certificates and NP. And what we're really going to do is um, yeah, define this second class of problems that you can quickly check the answer, but you can't necessarily quickly compute it. P is saying that you can compute it quickly. And NP is saying that you can check it quickly. So we have to say next, what does it mean to be able to check something quickly? Well, we need two ingredients. We need a small certificate and a fast verifier. So first of all, what's the small certificate part mean? It's a digital, digital proof. Uh, this might be cut off. So I'm going to say this is a proof that the answer is yes. Okay, so um, what a certificate is, is like justifying how do you know the answer is yes. So like for integer factorization, remember we said, does there exist a prime factor less than or equal to D? Or does there exist a factor less than or equal to D? Um, so what's the proof that there does exist a factor less than or equal to D is just the factor. <laughs> the least prime factor is a certificate uh, with minimum vertex cover. What's the proof that a graph has a small vertex cover is just the nodes in the vertex cover. Nodes in um, the vertex cover. Shortest path and longest path, the proof would be the same, is the path. Um, but it's either going to be a short one or a long one, depending on what problem you're solving. And in all these cases, uh, it's important to say that these are short certificates. So short really means polynomial size. Usually the certificate size will be smaller than the original problem size. And that's going to be the case with all of these, right? The nodes that are in the vertex cover is going to be less than all the nodes that are in the whole graph. The path for shortest or longest path is definitely going to be smaller than the whole graph that you started with. The factor is going to be smaller than the number that you started with. And so that's good. Um, a lot of times this is going to be obvious for what we're dealing with, but it's important to say it because you can play some tricks uh, that would make things not make sense if you're allowed to have like exponentially large certificates. Um, and since that doesn't make sense, we won't usually try to do it, but we have to be kind of careful about our definitions to not allow nonsense things to seek in. And what goes along with the certificate is a verifier algorithm, um, which takes the original problem that you're trying to solve and an alleged certificate, we actually played around with this uh, with some of our puzzles in class last week with graph problems, um, where I asked you to, for example, verify that a matching was valid or not, and whether it was maximal or not. And what you had to do was check things like, do all these edges actually exist in the original graph? Do they not overlap with each other? Um, and so that, that process that you did, that's actually what a verifier is. And of course, we don't want any verifier, but we want fast verifiers, uh, meaning that it should run in polynomial time. Um, and so again, we're only checking if the answer is yes. We won't try to prove or have verifiers for the answer being no. That might be more difficult. So like thinking, thinking here, if you want to prove that a vertex cover exists with size less than or equal to k, to prove the answer is yes, you just have to, you know, show me the cover. Show, you know, show me the vertex cover, and I'll check it. I'll check that all the nodes in that um, vertex cover that it has the right size, and that it covers all the correct edges. 
But if you want to say that the answer is no, that it doesn't have a vertex cover with at most size k, that's a harder thing to prove. How would you prove to me that something doesn't exist? And so that's why we're only going to try to say uh, that we need to check, have a certificate for, and verify um, when the answer is yes. And so the idea is kind of guess and check algorithms, where the answer is maybe tough to come up with, but checking is easy. So that's roughly what it means to have a small certificate and a fast verifier. And the cool thing is that even when problems are seem to be really hard, like factorization, right? Integer factorization seems to be a hard problem. We hope that it's hard. It's what the basis is for a lot of modern cryptography. But we can check the answer to a factorization pretty quickly. Uh, we just can't come up with that factor in every case. Uh, another way of thinking about this, uh, and this will be the last thing we talk about, is this example I have of a maze. So here's the problem is given a maze, can you escape from the center? So you're going to start in the center of this maze and you try to get to the outside. I don't know if this is how um, like hedge mazes work. Maybe you start from the outside and try to get to the center. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm going to say the problem is. Now think about what does this mean? Um, we're just asking, does there exist a way to get from the inside to the outside? It's possible if the answer is yes or no. right? It's possible that um, all the routes that you could try are ultimately going to be closed off and you're actually trapped in the middle. Um, but verifying a no answer would require you to explore all those paths. So verifying a no answer would be kind of hard. Whereas what does it take to verify a yes answer? All it takes is this certificate, which is a path from the inside to the outside. And so what are we thinking about with certificate is, first of all, how do we know a certificate is always going to exist if the answer is yes? Well, if you can't escape from the center, there must be some way to do it. How do we know that it's small? It must be smaller than the size of the original maze. Otherwise, you know, you can't go outside the bounds of the original maze. And then finally, how do we quickly verify it? Well, the verification algorithm in this case is just to drag it and line it up, right? So the verification algorithm in this case is like lining up that path, that certificate, and then checking that we didn't run through any walls. Of course, I could have given you a bonus, a bogus certificate that just like takes a diagonal path um, so I'll, I'll give a bogus certificate in red, which would be like going from here to there. Um, that may look silly. I could make it a little bit less silly looking like boom, 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 boom. And then it gets out, but that doesn't work, right? I went through a whole bunch of walls. So when you're checking the certificate, you should have no trust in what's being given to you. You really need to, um, check every detail. In this case, it means checking that it doesn't go through any walls. But now that you've seen this green certificate, that actually works, that checks out, that verifies that the answer is yes. Um, so that's what it means for our second complexity class, which is called NP. It's all of the problems that have a fast uh, short certificate and a fast verifier. So problems that um, can always be verified if the answer is yes. So a yes answer can be verified in polynomial time, um, but the no answer, maybe we can't. Um, so in order to define an MP proof, we have to first say like, what are the certificates? Why are they small, right? So this is a formal way of saying um, small, <laughs> small certificates. We have to say, what is the verifier algorithm? And then we have to say that it runs in time, big O of n to the k. Uh, which means fast, right? Because remember, for this unit, fast means polynomial time and slow means anything else. So in order to prove that a problem is NP, we just have to say it has a small certificate and a fast verifier. And that's all I want to talk about today. We'll get into practice of thinking about how to prove things are in NP or not a little bit next time. But just to remind you, we have P, which is the problems we can quickly solve. NP is the problems where we can quickly check the answer. This maze problem is a good example of one where um, solving it might require checking a little bit more, but checking the answer to that solution is fast. Once you're given a path, all you're doing is following it along, make sure it doesn't go through any walls, make sure it goes from the inside to the outside, and that verifies that the answer is yes. And the kind of big question is whether P and NP are the same thing. It should seem obvious that they're not the same, but uh, the teaser I'll give you is that no one in the world actually knows for sure whether the class P of things we can quickly solve 
and the class NP, which we can quickly check whether they're the same or not the same. And so we'll spend the next few days uh, really exploring that question and seeing um, how we would even um, consider approaching that kind of question. Thanks a lot.